Welcome to the lecture of this series and uh, this week's lecture. In the previous week, we got ourselves introduced to uh, mineral exploration with an overview of uh, classification, economic classification of mineral resources and with the uh, concept at the back of our mind exactly what we are going to explore, what we are looking for. And, uh, mostly we will be restricting ourselves to the discussion on the scientific aspects of mineral exploration and the science that all that we have acquired, got an overview of the processes that form mineral deposits and we will see how effectively we will be in a position to utilize that knowledge to uh, develop the methodologies or to see the how the methodologies actually work by using principles, so using the scientific principles that we learnt about mineral deposit formation in general. In the last week, we uh, just began our discussion and uh, uh, we also uh, uh, discussed that the it is the geological method which lies at the core of the activities and we use, use the fundamental knowledge on the geochemical characteristics of metals elements, their mobility in the primary and the secondary geochemical cycles and uh, use these uh, principles to identify the or to detect the presence of mineral deposits which are hidden below the surface by uh, bringing up or by uh, coming out with something which we call as geochemical anomaly and the geochemical anomaly. Uh, as we discussed could be of various nature and dimension and mag magnitude uh, give coming up coming from the coming as signatures of hidden mineral deposits below the surface and they need to be very very uh, carefully uh, interpreted and the, there are lots of intricacies involved which uh, we discussed a little bit uh, uh, about them and uh, the geochemical uh, methods that we use. Uh, can be broadly the lithogeochemical uh, when we take the samples of the rocks which are exposed on the surface and when we uh, suspect that there is some mineral deposit uh, which is uh, um, present below the surface. Then we sample the rocks, uh, the sampling strategy being decided by our background geological knowledge and uh, the ge overall geological setting, <coughs> the rock types and uh, from which we built up or we developed the idea and through our reconnaissance and detailed survey stages, we wanted we, we, we intend to delineate the ore body and use geochemical methods. If the area is soil covered, then we solve the sample the soil. If, the, if there are some water bodies, uh, stagnant surface water bodies or ground water which is subsurface which are circulating ground water through uh, the rock formations which are water bearing rock formations or we can also analyze the plants which grow on the soil, uh, the soils being overburdened to a mineral deposit which is lying below and sometimes we also use the method of uh, analyzing the rare gases in the atmosphere and sample them and also can uh, go about uh, our exploration for hidden mineral deposits of specific types like for example, the uranium deposits and we also do uh, take help of the uh, geophysical methods and we do not have the scope of getting into the uh, details of these methods because they need a very elaborate understanding on the physical principles which is beyond the scope of this lecture series. But what we can do, we can just see how these methods uh, without getting into their much of uh, details uh, in terms of the interpretation of data or the detailed mathematical uh, treatment that is done to the geophysical data that are required. We can see some case studies where such methods have been utilized. As I have stated before, a successful discovery of a mineral deposit is after is an outcome of utilization of all the techniques. Uh, and uh, synthesis of all the information together uh, which will be 
we generally work in uh, reinforcing uh, each other and to finally, uh, get a confirmation or get a idea, get an idea about the presence or absence of a mineral deposit which is below the surface. So, when it comes to a situation like gravity that means, we are actually using the fundamental physical property, physical the contrast in the physical property between our suspected ore body and the surrounding rock. Gravity is uh, um, uh, essentially will be if we take uh, the normal situation where there are crustal rocks, the gravity signature that we get is a background signature or a normal regional signature which we get. And if we uh, if there is a body say for example, there is a, this kind of uh, things could be very well depicted. Essentially, what I am representing here is a uh, part somewhere anywhere in the crust where it is a normal crustal rocks, silicate rocks. Let us consider this a nicic rock or a felsic uh, uh, rock or some kind of a uh, beta sediments or uh, quartzofelspathic nice country rock, and in which we have a body of an ore which is uh, concealed below the surface. So, fundamentally. Suppose let us let us uh, consider that this uh, happens to be an ore body of chromite or say or magnetite. So, if it happens to be a body of chromite, then this body of chromite is likely to have a distinctly different uh, density and the uh, then the rock which are surrounding uh, in the uh, surrounding this body and if we take the uh, the the gravity field or the gra the gravity you know, the gravity uh, uh, field of this area then we definitely going to get some signature uh, which will be indicating that there is some body which is present there by by virtue of its higher specific gravity higher density it is creating an, an anomalous area which can be detected if we do a gravity survey in the area say if it happens to be a body of magnetite then it is like uh, this body of magnetite by virtue of its higher magnetic susceptibility will also cause the local magnetic field which can be measured by uh, a magnetometer there are various uh, components that we measure here and we uh, take something which is called a magnetic anomaly and we present them whether it is a gravity or it is ma magnetic property then we present the data or the result in the form of the anomaly map and contouring them on, on this surface on a two dimensional or a three dimensional view and uh, suspect the presence of such kind of a body which, which by virtue of its difference in the physical property like a magnetic property or the specific gravity or even say for example, if this this body this uh, ore body that we are showing here is uh, is a body of sulphide is a metal metal sulphide. So, this metal sulphide body uh, by will will have a higher electrical conductivity compared to the surrounding uh, rocks. So, if we take a measurement on the electrical conductivity or what exactly we measure which is essentially a, the resistivity which is inverse of conductivity of the rock mass over here and uh, take uh, traverses and different uh, uh, such kind of uh, traverses we take then by virtue 
of the difference in the electrical conductivity of the ore body with respect to the surrounding rock it is going to give us some signal in the form of a lower resistivity body which is present in the surround in the surrounding of the gen normal country rock. So, these so here we are essentially using our basic principles of the uh, electrical methods uh, of uh, the, the electrical methods of prospecting or a magnetic uh, methods of prospecting or a uh, gravity method of prospecting and these are the uh, basic uh, difference in the physical property of the ore bodies. And when we are discussing with a simple diagram, we are uh, presenting a case where we start with a very simple shape of the uh, of the ore body and in nature the shape of the ore body could could be at, could attain any uh, complicated geometry and the kind of anomaly what we are called calling as either it is a it is a gravity anomaly it is a gravity anomaly or an anomaly which is detected by electrical resistivity or the uh, magnetic or detecting a magnetic anomaly or uh, a an electromagnetic which is another method which uh, also depending on the uh, the property of the ore body we can also use a method which is an electromagnetic method and we also use the seismic method where uh, the the seismic method initially uh, essentially is, is used uh, taking help of the difference in the uh, the a difference in the the way the elastic waves propagate through the rocks and they are more effectively utilized for hydrocarbon resources like petroleum and natural gas but uh, uh, often or very uh, infrequently used for uh, exploration of metal metallic deposits either oxide or sulfide deposits and so uh, we can also uh, have the radiometric methods by which we measure the uh, the electro, uh, the the radio uh, the radioactive waves which are emanating from the radioactive decay of uh, parent radionuclide like uranium thorium and such deposits when they are concealed below the surface uh, of the earth and uh, they generally uh, give a higher than background value of such intensity of this uh, uh, electromagnetic rays which are essentially the gamma ray which have a greater penetration and are measurable by using uh, appropriate device. So, all these uh, methods uh, that we uh, we employ for uh, the geophysical methods of exploration or even we can call prospecting they use sophisticated instrumentation and in this uh, field only the development has been quite uh, uh, significant in terms of the methodology used for reduction of the data and uh, now there are uh, often what is used as combination of more than one technique and joint uh, many of the data are combinedly used uh, for a better interpretation and more dependable interpretation for detection of hidden ore bodies. And uh, as, I have, as I have said that a successful discovery of a mineral deposit eventually would have used uh, the both geochemical and geophysical uh, methods and all the uh, results when they are compiled or synthesized uh, together then only the uh, final result in terms of the uh, inference on inference on whether a deposit exists or not uh, is actually made after the complete uh, evaluation of all the data that is generated by these methods. So, we will not be getting into all the uh, very fundamental principles with their equations with their on, on even the working principles of these uh, 
situ things like a gravimeter or a proton precision magnetometer or um, a gamma ray spectrometer things like that or even even instruments like seismograph which detects the uh, uh, the seismic waves that are generated by some artificial means uh, in the process of mineral exploration. So, with this much of a background information, so we will be dealing with uh, the discovery of some selected uh, deposit types and also we will see the general uh, methodology that could be applicable in general for exploration of some uh, specific type of deposits. And as we have stated before, mineral exploration today is essentially targeted towards specific uh, deposit types of specific uh, metals and uh, the exploration uh, program is so designed so that it takes into account those identified geological elements which are to be specifically looked for uh, during the process of during exploration of such deposits. Okay. Uh, with that little bit of a brief introduction of uh, the geology this uh, exploration methods that is employed. We will uh, try to have a bit of an overview general idea about a very uh, widely used methodology of the present day that is the remote sensing in mineral exploration. Uh, if we even start from very standard definition what remote sensing is that we make uh, impressions or idea or um, estimation about any object uh, by examining it from a remote distance. So, the remote, uh, remote sensing generally could be done by, uh, by a satellite which can be put into an uh, orbit as hundreds of kilometers above the earth surface or it could be airborne. We, uh, we saw some of the points uh, that uh, we do have uh, many such airborne uh, exploration methods, airborne, uh, airborne magnetic method, airborne gravity survey where we generate gravity anomaly or magnetic anomaly of uh, large regions which can be used during the reconnaissance survey and uh, similarly the uh, remote sensing work can also be carried out by taking the instruments which are our spectrometers in aircrafts which will be only within about a few thousand meters from the surface of the earth and the, the kind of uh, maps that they, they will be generated by airborne methods will usually have a larger bit larger scale than that, that of the satellite satellites because these are placed hundreds of kilometers above the surface of the earth and there the advantage is that we can get a uh, synoptic uh, view of the earth surface and could examine the earth objects. The earth objects will be the rocks, soil, water and vegetation. So, in, in the, this short discussion that we will have on this remote sensing method, we will not consider the airborne uh, methods which were initially were called as, uh, uh, as aerial photographs which we will not be discussing. And these days even there are airborne uh, spectral radiometers which also do, um, take uh, the uh, reflection from the earth surface on the, uh, the radiometer in the electromagnetic waves. So, we will not be considering uh, the airborne method, we will be only be discussing the satellite remote sensing method. So, as we know this uh, satellite remote sensing that is done is essentially could be of two that is the uh, passive remote sensing and active remote sensing. So, passive remote sensing is the one in which we use the sun's electromagnetic energy for uh, for our use in case of active remote sensing we generate our own electromagnetic wave of a desired wavelength for very specific purposes and we will not be discussing much uh, discussing on this active remote sensing mostly we uh, focusing on the methods which are essentially the passive remote sensing where we are using the sun's electromagnetic uh, radiation that is interacting on the earth objects and the resultant 
uh, waves that are reflected as well as emitted from the earth's surface analyzing them and making meaningful, meaningful interpretation about the earth objects uh, specifically to see how they will be helpful in mineral exploration. So, essentially uh, we can call that this remote sensing is nothing but a, a spectrometry in the largest possible dimension when we are uh, taking the earth surface which is I mean, taking a view of several hundreds of square kilometer uh, area of the earth surface at any one point of time and, uh, um, uh, and receiving the uh, re reflected or emitted electromagnetic spectrum in this uh, entire wavelength um, uh, that is coming from the different earth objects as we say rocks, soils, water and vegetation. So, the coming to the very fundamental um, ideas about the remote sensing, the remote sensing essentially are what we understand that the camera uh, on the that is mounted on a satellite is essentially a spectrometer uh, that is designed to receive the electromagnetic radiation in specific uh, wavelength intervals and that is how and the data are recorded in the in digital form and are subjected to a very elaborate exercise of digital image processing which is uh, uh, which we will not be discussing in details in this lecture. Uh, they they are a specialized uh, topic of digital image processing uh, of uh, remote sensing which uh, could be taught separately, but here we will only be concerned about the uh, application to remote sensing here on this diagram. Uh, it gives us an idea. So, this uh, remote sensing satellites are uh, they were launched way back in the mid 70s uh, starting from the Landsat series. The MSS is the multispectral scanner and the TM is the thematic mapper, Aster is the advanced space borne thermal emission of radiation uh, radiometry and uh, SPOT is a French satellite. So, these are the ones which are the sun synchronous uh, satellites which are designed for uh, acquiring the uh, the uh, digital image the acquiring the image information image in uh, the electromagnetic uh, radiation and will be st will be uh, stored uh, in digital form which can be processed to give the satellite imagery is what we examine so considering the sun so here we could see the uh, ranges so here uh, on the x axis is the pixel size which is given in meter kilometer and we could see that uh, satellite uh, camera like spectrometer like a multispectral scanner uh, having some kind of uh, around 70 meter by 70 meter of uh, the pixel size or what is basically essentially known as the instantaneous field of view IFOV the instantaneous field of view and this multispectral scanner uh, and then uh, the thematic mapper, thematic mapper had uh, a little even smaller uh, the area about 30 meter uh, thematic mapper is uh, somewhere here, the thematic mapper was kind uh, mostly uh, 30 meter by 30 meter area as a instantaneous field of view. So, the uh, uh, utility of or the usefulness of the satellite camera is essentially dependent on these two parameters and uh, it gives it gives the frequency of re repetitive cover per day so to so that uh, any part of the earth surface could be repetitively uh, uh, studied uh, to take care of many of the transient phenomena like cloud cover and many other uh, things and here uh, the these uh, satellites as you will see them later so the utility of those satellites will be depending on uh, what is the uh, this pixel or which we can call as the ground resolution ground resolution. So, smaller is the ground resolution uh, a better the satellite imagery is because we could study features which could be of uh, much smaller dimension. For example, if a any earth features like a like a mineralized vein which measures only in a few tens of meters may not be uh, possible to be studied by a satellite imagery where the ground resolution is 70 meter to 70 meter 
whereas uh, so the, that means uh, the better and better the ground resolution better it is uh, useful for mineral exploration purpose and uh, so these are the so the mss the multispectral scanner was sometimes in the mid 70s was launched by the nasa and it was followed later on by the uh, satellite uh, uh, spectrometers which were improved and in what way we can just see because the other aspect of a satellite uh, imagery is that in what spectral range this particular spectrometer has been processing the uh, electromagnetic uh, the range of the electrom the wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum and in how many for in what intervals or what window so here the we could just see that this is the landsat this is some of the summary data of the remote sen sensing satellites and what is uh, marked here is present is in fact uh, taken from the book on mineral exploration it was uh, way back in 2006 so this gives an idea about what was going on till that time period or what all the satellite data were there so you could see a uh, satellite camera like aster which is advanced space borne thermal emission um, radiation radiometry uh, which operates in the thermal uh, range of the thermal infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum and you could see the thematic mapper which is uh, looking at the uh, multispectral scanner which was uh, working within the wavelength of uh, the spectral bands bands 4, 5, 6 and 7, the 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, 0 0.8 to 1.1 in terms of uh, the micrometer. So, mostly in the visible range uh, we, as you could see and the thematic mapper uh, had bands some of them uh, close to the that of the multispectral scanner, but had the other spectral uh, bands in the longer in the infrared range uh, which was designed uh, to uh, for a better study of the earth of earth materials uh, where the spectrometry in this uh, infrared range could give much better information as far as the uh, features associated with mineralization are concerned which will be seeing them in a short while. So, we could see the a multispectral scanner in this field instant instantaneous field of view is 79 meter to 79 meter in case of band 1 to 3 and 82 into 82 into band 4 and here the thematic mapper with a, a ground resolution of 30 meter by 30 meter from the band 1, 5 and 7 and 120 to 120 uh, meter in band 6 and uh, so this also gives an idea about the amount of data that is generated pixels per scene is 28 into 10 to the power 6 means uh, the how many number of such um, resolution elements could be covered in one scene which would be uh, a certain uh, area that the satellite camera covers. And uh, uh, so, these are essentially visibly you could see that these are the developments of their previous uh, versions. For example, the thematic mapper was a far more useful spectrometer than multispectral scanner. Similarly, the enhanced uh, enhanced thematic mapper was a uh, better better in terms of its spectral coverage and even the advanced space borne thermal emission radiation radiometer was uh, even having much more number of such spectral bands. So, it essentially uh, means that the uh, as, a, as we are uh, discussing about the usefulness of a particular satellite. So, in addition to the ground resolution a satellite also uh, the satellite camera the spectrometer also is uh, its its uh, utility is also judged by the spectr by the by the spectral resolution that means in what uh, smaller spectral range that the spectrometer is able to process uh, receive the data and store and process so we will be continuing with this uh, principles and its utility for mineral exploration uh, thank you